Okay, so yesterday, uh, the end of the lecture during the afternoon, I start to, to present to you uh, some basic concepts concerning uh, parametric remote sensing and uh, what I have explained to you yesterday. Usually, uh, when we receive uh, a fully parametric star image, we we apply this very very simple processing chain just to 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 get an idea about the the content of uh, the parametric uh, star images to 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 have a understanding about the different scattering mechanism which can occur inside the the, the pixel. So usually we have uh, three steps. So the first step is a parametric speckle filtering. So this is uh, what I have presented to you yesterday. So remember, today we have not yet found the optimal uh, speckle filter. So we continue to work on that uh, because we have not uh, uh, a good idea about what can be uh, the noise model uh, of uh, this speckle. It can be a kind of a multiplicative noise plus sometimes additive noise. So it's uh, quite difficult to. Uh, to modelize this kind of, uh, of uh, noise, so this is why we have still a lot to do in this uh, in this topic. Then remember that at the output of uh, this kind of uh, uh, signal processing, we are going to increase the number of uh, degrees of freedom, which from a physical point of view is not possible. So remember the input of uh, this uh, uh, speckle filter. Each pixel has a physical dimension equal to five because the pixel can be described by five independent parameters. And at the output, due to the fact that I'm going to average my information, the physical dimension can reach nine. So I have uh, four more degrees of freedom. So what I'm obliged to do, I'm obliged to apply a decomposition. So the idea is to reconstruct something which is a uh, physics with a physical dimension equal to five. So we have seen uh, there exists a great collection of uh, different uh, target decomposition. Uh, the decomposition based on the eigenvalues, on the eigenvectors, the decomposition based on a model with different components uh, from three components to six components. And uh, we have uh, also the coherent decomposition, etc., etc. So there is not the best decomposition, it depends your application. If you want to reconstruct uh, some uh, scattering uh, mechanism, like a single bounce, double bounce, or volume scattering, it's better to take a model-based decomposition because you can separate each coherence matrix or each covariance matrix and then reconstruct the corresponding covariance matrix of the scattering mechanism. So in such a case, it's better to take a model decomposition. If you want to do some uh, detection, some uh, identification, maybe it's better to uh, to use uh, eigenvalues, eigenvector decomposition. So it depends the application. And now to conclude uh, this part, uh, the, the last part uh, usually, uh, we apply a very simple uh, segmentation, classification, just to have an idea about uh, the different uh, scattering mechanism which can occur uh, in the in the pixel so i propose to continue on this uh, on this topic and then uh, i shall conclude by a specific presentation concerning the dual pole configuration what can we do uh, with a dual pole uh, system of course uh, it's not possible to do all what we can do with a fully parametric system so I propose to, to, to present to you uh, the limitation of uh, using uh, such configuration. Okay, so let's start with a classification. So yesterday we have seen the first step of this classification. So remember, this is what we did uh, with the Shen Cloud in uh, 1995. Uh, the idea was to use both entropy and uh, alpha parameters and to project uh, these two information in the plane so what we call the entropy alpha plane. And uh, we separate this plane in a, in a height 
areas, nine areas, but uh, one is not uh, physical, so in uh, eight areas. And so like that, we can uh, discriminate different canonical scattering mechanisms. And so if we affect uh, a color for each of uh, these uh, areas, it's possible to get uh, this unsupervised segmentation. Okay, so it's not very, very beautiful. I'm going to show now a new uh, concept. But uh, remember, it was in 1995, so uh, a long time ago. And we were very happy uh, to, uh, to get uh, this kind of uh, image. For sure, we have a lot of uh, drawbacks in this classification. Uh, the most important problem was the location of the boundaries between uh, the different areas in the entropy alpha plane. If you move a little bit, these boundaries, your result will change totally. So it means that it's not consistent according to, the, to these boundaries. So there is somewhere a, a kind of degree of uh, arbitrariness of the setting of these boundaries. For example, we fix for entropy equal 0 0.5, which is a, a vertical boundary, but <clears throat> why 0 0.5? Uh, we could uh, we could select 0 0.4 or 0 0.6. Okay, so this is a a, a, a great a great limitation. And so uh, the idea was trying to uh, to find a kind of uh, data distribution uh, to understand if it's possible to to use some classical uh, uh, classification procedure like the maximum likelihood ratio, for example. So what we did with some years after, so in 2000, with Janssen Lee, in fact, we were working on a, on, a, on a PDF. What can be the PDF to perfectly describe the evolution? Okay, to, to, to describe the, the, the evolution of this coherence matrix. Okay, so I come back here. I have a question concerning the explanation of alpha. If you remember, uh, the starting point concerns the coherency matrix, the three by three coherency matrix, and I derive the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. From the eigenvalues, uh, it's possible to derive the entropy. And uh, from the Hagen vectors, we apply a model on uh, each Hagen vector. And uh, on this uh, model, we have an uh, alpha parameter for the free Hagen vector. Then we derive the average alpha parameter, which is constructed from the alpha 1, alpha 2, or alpha 3 for the free Hagen vectors. And we have seen that uh, this parameter is a role invariant. It means that uh, this parameter is independent of the position of the radar during the acquisition. So this is something which is very uh, important. So uh, the idea was to try to find a physical interpretation. So this is what we did from a theoretical approach. And we have seen that uh, in the case of a single bound, uh, alpha parameter is close to zero. In the case of a double bounce, alpha parameter is close to 90 degrees. And uh, in the case of a volume scattering, alpha parameter is close to 45 degrees. Okay. So this is an ideal explanation of, uh, of this parameter. So this is very important to use these two parameters because the entropy gives to you the number, the number of scattering mechanism, which are present inside each pixel. If entropy is very low, it means that I have one scattering mechanism, a very strong one scattering mechanism. And if entropy is very high, it means that I have several scattering mechanism, but I have a random scattering mechanism. So it can be a volume scattering mechanism, but it is a, a random scattering mechanism. So entropy provides to you the number of scattering mechanism inside the inside the pixel, but I don't know which kind of scattering mechanism. Okay, and so I need to use alpha. Uh, alpha parameter provide to you the type of scattering mechanism. 
the alpha parameter that I can conclude that this scattering mechanism is a single bond, or this scattering mechanism is a double bond. Okay? Alpha type of scattering mechanism, entropy number of scattering mechanism inside the pixel. Okay, so if I come back on this slide, and we continue to work with uh, Janssen Lee, and the idea was to find was to find a, a PDF about uh, this uh, fully parametric information. So I remember that uh, I'm processing uh, coherency matrix. Okay, so I'm trying to find a distribution of this kind of a matrix. Okay, so this is a list of the different uh, publications we did on this uh, on this topic. Okay, and so if we uh, if we start uh, yep. to take uh, then yeah. So remember that uh, I have defined uh, different descriptors. The different descriptors we have the scattering matrix. Okay, and we have also the target vectors. So here I have displayed the two target vectors. So the first one, which corresponds to the lexicographic target vector, and the second one, K, which corresponds to the Pauli target vector. So you can see that uh, each of these target vectors is a function of the different parametric channel, HH, HG, VV. If we consider that uh, this uh, kind of uh, information is a uh, random information, in such a case, the associated probability function will be a Gaussian, a Gaussian density function, which is here, okay, which is expressed here. So the probability density function of these target vectors are a Gaussian distribution. And for sure, by definition, we are going to find the covariance matrix or the coherency matrix as a second moment order of the covariance. Okay, so this is for a target vector. Now, in the Howe case, we are not processing target vectors because remember there is this absolute phase, this random phase. So it's better to process the coherency matrix. And in fact, uh, looking in the literature, we have found that a lot of years before, the mathematician, Mr. Bouchard, worked on this kind of uh, distribution concerning the covariance matrix. So covariance matrix is equivalent to a coherency matrix. And he has found that uh, the, the distribution for such information is a complex distribution. And so he gives uh, his name. So now it is known as a complex Wishart distribution. Okay. So it was, uh, it was something very important. We have found, we have found the associated distribution for the coherency matrix. But what is very important, if we look to this kind of distribution, we can see that uh, this distribution has an exponential, exponential uh, form. So it's very, it's very useful when you want to derive some distance, we shall see uh, after, when you apply the maximum uh, like layout uh, approach, uh, it's very easy to, 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 to play with uh, exponential uh, writing of this kind of distribution. We can see that uh, this distribution is a function of uh, L. L is a number of look. So you can apply this distribution to, uh, to multi-look SAR images or to single-look SAR image. So this can be applied whatever the number of look. You have just to adapt the, the number L. What is also very important is the P, P here. Yeah which correspond to the parametric dimension. And what does it mean? It means that I can apply this, this, this distribution for the dual pole case. Dual pole case means I shall have two channels. So in such a case, P will be equal to two. I can apply this distribution for the monostatic fully parametric configuration. In such a case, P will be equal to three. I can apply this distribution for the fully parametric be static configuration. In such a case, P will be equal to four. 
I can even apply this distribution for Pauline SAR configuration. So in such a case, P will be equal to six or to tomography and P will be equal to the number of tracks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a very powerful distribution because you can adapt this distribution to the configuration of your acquisition. Okay, so we start with uh, this uh, TM. Okay, TM. Oops. So TM, you, you can see that uh, this distribution is a conditional distribution. Okay, so TM corresponds to a class center. Okay, so the idea of this distribution provides to you the probability that the coherency matrix on the test, this one, belongs to the class which is represented by the class center TM. Okay. Yeah. So it is a conditional distribution. Okay, so we start with the distribution and in fact, we use a very classical classification procedure, which is based on the bias maximum likelihood. And uh, this, uh, this uh, procedure gives to you the information that uh, the pixel on the test, which is represented by this coherency matrix, belongs to this class represented by the average coherency matrix. That means uh, the cluster center. And so this pixel will belong to this class if, if the probability Tm knowing T will be higher than the probability that uh, T belongs to the other classes. Okay. So if we apply this rule, the bias rule, in fact, it's very easy to derive, to derive the distance because in fact, the conclusion will be a distance which is represented here. Okay, so we can transfer this uh, formula in a distance. So in fact, this pixel will belong to this class if the distance is the minimum distance between this pixel and this class compared to the other classes. And so this is what is written here. So for each pixel, I'm going to, to derive the distance between the coherency matrix of this pixel and the coherency matrix corresponding to the different cluster center. And the minimum distance, I shall uh, affect this pixel to the corresponding class. So it's very easy, in fact, it's very easy and it's very easy to implement. And thanks to the exponential distribution here, it's very easy to derive the expression of the distance. And so it's very easy to derive, okay? There is no problem. Okay, so this is what we have done. So what is important in this approach is that uh, it is independent of the number of looks because you have seen that a distribution is function of L, L is the number of looks, so you can adapt the coefficient L according to the number of looks. It is independent of the polarization basis because if you change your elliptical basis transformation, as it is a unitary transformation, the distribution will be the same, will be the same. So remember, all what I have presented to you yesterday, each time I was using a unitary transformation. And uh, this kind of transformation keep keep all the information about the distribution. So this is why the if you if you work in a circular basis or if you work in a linear basis from a parametric point of view, the distribution will be exactly the same. Exactly the same. Something which is very important because I had some question uh, yesterday concerning the covariance matrix compared to the coherency matrix. Here also. Remember that I, I have shown a uh, unitary transformation to move from the coherency matrix to the covariance matrix or to the covariance to the coherency. So what does it mean? It means that uh, this Richard distribution is exactly the same, the same if I'm working with the coherency matrix or if I'm working with the covariance matrix. Okay, so it is exactly the same thing. And as I explained to you just before, I can adapt this distribution according to the dimension of the parametric information. So I shall put a P equal two for dual pole, P equal three for pulsar, and P equal six for polinsar. Okay, so it's in fact, in conclusion, it's very easy 
to uh, derive uh, this uh, this distance, okay, to uh, to do this classification. Okay, so now if I want to uh, to apply this in a k-mean classification procedure, which is represented here, the most important step usually concerns the initialization. So if you want to do this kind of classification, what you do, you take a, a random a random set of uh, of uh, samples to make the initialization. You run the classification, you get some results. Then you start again with another random distribution. You run again, then you compare the result. And one moment, you are going to converge uh, to, uh, to the final results, which are uh, very close to, uh, to, uh, to, to the good results. In our case, we said, instead of uh, using a random initialization, Maybe it will be uh, very nice to use some physics. And so the idea was to, to use entropy alpha plane. Entropy alpha plane, so remember, I have different uh, areas here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to uh, derive the cluster center of uh, each of these uh, areas, which is represented here. So Tm will be uh, the average coherency matrix for each of these areas. And so I have average all the currency matrix belong, belonging to uh, each of these areas. And then I'm, I'm using this to do the initialization of my procedure. So in fact, uh, somewhere I'm going to, uh, to use some uh, physics for this kind of uh, signal processing. And then I'm going to run, to run this uh, procedure. So for each pixel, after I'm going to, uh, to derive the distance and to affect each pixel for each class. And uh, during uh, this uh, iteration, I adapt the cluster center. And so I'm going to converge to the final cluster center after I reach my termination criterion, which usually is the maximum number of iteration. And I get, I get this image, which is a fully unsupervised segmentation okay so it's very it's a nice uh, segmentation compared to the very simple uh, entropy alpha uh, segmentation we did before okay so you can recognize uh, the different uh, important areas of uh, of uh, this uh, this image the ocean areas we can detect uh, three different uh, uh, sea surface uh, we can detect uh, easily the urban areas, we can detect the parks, the vegetation, etc., etc. But we can see that uh, we have some errors. For example, if we have a look uh, inside uh, this uh, park uh, in the middle here, ah, we don't see. <coughs> anyway. Here. Oh, nope. bon. anyway. So in the middle, we have a stadium. And the stadium is classified like a forest. We have also the library here, the building here in the middle of, uh, of this park, which is also classified as a forest. We have also uh, here, well, it is in, in, uh, in black, uh, all the green pixels along the coast, <coughs> which are classified like a forest. So we have some errors. So it means that uh, using entropy and alpha, maybe is not sufficient to do this uh, segmentation. Okay, but remember that uh, we have a third parameter, which is anisotropy. And so the idea was to use also the anisotropy. And if we look to this uh, cube of uh, information, we can see on this cube uh, the three parameters which are represented. We have the classical uh, entropy alpha plane here in the front face. But uh, on the two other side of uh, this cube, we have the information of uh, the anisotropy. And you can see that uh, with the uh, anisotropy, maybe we can separate different areas which are in the same, in the same cluster center here when I'm using entropy and uh, alpha only parameters. So anisotropy is very useful in the case, in the case of a uh, high entropy value. Okay, so the idea was to introduce this information more. <clears throat> and so what we have done, we have applied exactly what 
I have presented to you before, but in two different steps. So the first step here, I'm using the classical Kimin procedure, classification procedure I have shown to you before. And when I reach the, the final uh, iteration, now I introduce anisotropy. Okay, so what does it mean? It means that I'm going to separate the cluster centers according to the value of the anisotropy. If it is higher than 0 0.5 or lower than 0 0.5. And I start again. I start again my uh, Kimin classification procedure. So for sure, I multiply by two the number of the classes. But like that, I can reach to a beta segmentation, which is here. And so you can see that uh, now I can separate, I can separate the different uh, areas I have shown before where I had some errors. And so now I can recognize perfectly the stadium compared to the vegetation. I can see different uh, sea surface. I have a better result concerning the urban area segmentation or the, 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 the park uh, segmentation. Okay, so this is the final result. And, uh, we consider that it was quite a very, very good segmentation and not very difficult to implement. And it is a fully unsupervised segmentation. Okay, so you just, uh, remember, you just take uh, for each pixel the coherency matrix. You derive eigenvalues, eigenvector, you derive entropy and zootropy and alpha parameters, that's it. And then uh, you run the Kamin uh, uh, classification procedure based on the Wishart distribution. And that's it. Okay, so it's a nice, uh, it's a nice result. And if we if we look into the details, uh, we have some uh, funny details. If we if we if we look, for example, in this area here, in this area, uh, do you see that? In this area here, you can see a bright point in the middle, which is represented uh, here in this image, and uh, this corresponds, in fact, to a lighthouse uh, over a small island as the entrance of uh, this bay. And what is uh, very nice when uh, you look to the result of the segmentation is that uh, you recognize the double bounds in red between the lighthouse and the highland. You have uh, maybe uh, some vegetation uh, around uh, around uh, the, this uh, lighthouse. Uh, you can uh, recognize uh, the green pixel. And uh, around the highland, you have different uh, sea surface for, for, for sure, because you are close to, uh, to, to the highland. And you can see the different uh, sea surface according to the different blue colors. Okay, so this is a uh, very interesting. Another interesting part uh, concerns this area here. Yeah. So if you know uh, San Francisco Bay, this uh, area is uh, the, the Alcatraz Bale Highland. Uh, so it was a very famous uh, jail, which is closed now, uh, but you can visit uh, this uh, this uh, island. And so this is uh, the classical SAR image uh, on the top here, and this is the result here of the segmentation. And uh, if you visit this uh, island, uh, you will uh, you will have uh, all the buildings of the jail, the jail buildings, and you have two water towers uh, on the two borders of uh, this uh, of this island and. You can recognize, in fact, uh, these uh, two towers in the in the red color, and uh, the building in the in the yellow color. And in the middle of uh, of this uh, highland, you have a very important park with uh, vegetation, and so you can discriminate all the green pixels, which correspond to uh, to the vegetation. So it's a nice result of this very simple unsupervised segmentation and using only a, a fully parametric uh, data. Some other examples uh, here. This is a, a segmentation of the of a forest uh, in France, in the south of France, it is a, the Nether Forest. So this is a result of the segmentation and the different classes, in fact, are uh, linked to uh, to the age of the trees, to the species of the trees. So it's also a, a good segmentation. Uh, this is a sea height segmentation. So according to the different uh, the uh, height of the layers to the different layers to the different uh, density we have uh, this kind of uh, segmentation this is a uh, halling in the in the south of, uh, of uh, munich uh, close to the dlr the, the german uh, uh, space center 
so this is agriculture uh, areas and uh, with forest and with a small village. And this is the result of the segmentation. And one this part also, which is very nice, uh, this is a DLR, uh, the German Aerospace Center. So this is a runway uh, uh, for, 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 for the plane. Uh, this is wrestling, this is a, a city, this is a, the center here with the different buildings. Uh, and this is a surrounding forest. So this is a result of the segmentation. And if we go uh, into the details, uh, we can uh, we can have a, a zoom of uh, this uh, center, so we can recognize, for example, here the different uh, light on the parking, metallic uh, light. So you have the double bond so between uh, this uh, this pylon and, uh, and the parking. So this is the red point. You have the different buildings uh, inside the center, and something which is uh, very uh, nice to see concern this area. So you can see in this area. Uh, this corresponds to an open surface with grass, etc. And when you, we look to the segmentation, we can see that uh, we can uh, separate this area in two classes, the yellow class and the gray class. So it means that uh, the surface is not the same uh, on, this, uh, on this open area. And if we have a look to the, to the ground truth, in fact, we can see that uh, in the red circle, this corresponds to, uh, to a football grass. And uh, here it's, it is an uh, open field with a, with a high grass. So in fact, the scattering is not at all the same. And so we can uh, easily detect uh, this, uh, this specific area. And we can even detect in red the double bonds uh, between the ground and uh, the gold, okay? the metallic, uh, metallic uh, part uh, of, uh, of the gold. So it's very, very, very funny if we go into, into this kind of uh, details. And using only parametry. Okay. And then we continue a little bit to work on, uh, on this topic, trying to, uh, to improve this, uh, this segmentation. And now the idea was to, uh, to introduce more physics during this segmentation. And uh, the idea was to propose an unsupervised classification preserving scattering mechanism. So what does it mean? It means that, uh, in fact, uh, we have applied the Freeman and Durden decomposition. Uh, at that time, uh, we had only the Freeman and the, as model-based decomposition. We had only Freeman and Durden decomposition. We did not have Yamaguchi decomposition. So, in fact, we are using this uh, Freeman and Durden decomposition. And remember what I have explained to you yesterday, it's possible to separate, according to the model, the pixels which belong to the single scattering class, the pixel which belongs to the double bound scattering class, and the pixel which belong to volume scattering class. Okay, so in fact, what we have, we have uh, three, three classes at the beginning, according to, uh, to the scattering category. And then what we are going to apply, we are going to apply for each of this scattering category, the iteration or the classification procedure I have presented to you before. Okay, so it means that uh, by the end, I shall have a classification of the single bond scattering mechanism. I shall have a classification of the double bond scattering mechanism. And then I shall have a classification of the volume scattering mechanism. And so from these three uh, results, I shall merge the three results to create the final classification. And so this is what we get concerning this, uh, for example, this uh, San Francisco area. And we can see that uh, we have a very, very uh, good result. We have a better result if we compare to the previous uh, result I have presented to you. So this uh, classification map is a, is a very, very nice uh, and provide very good result. Okay, so if we go uh, into the details and you, you can see that uh, according to the predominance of the scattering me mechanism, we can, uh, we can uh, change the number of classes according to the different scattering mechanism. So here we can see that uh, the most important scattering mechanism all over the image correspond to surface uh, scattering. So this is why we had more classes 
corresponding to the surface uh, scattering uh, mechanism, also for volume and also for double bonds. Is the part with the oriented bleeding missing here? Yes, because it is uh, uh, it start uh, just uh, after here, <laughs> just after. Okay, so it is uh, it's not on this image. Uh, in Persa Pro, yes, for sure. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, I have not the virtual machine, but uh, I could. Uh, I can show. Quite suspicious. Okay, where? I don't uh, understand uh, the remark of uh, Peter because. Ah, oui, ok. Ah non, 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 euh, non, don't worry. <laughs> uh, I can tell you that uh, this image was made by uh, Janssen, so the slides are coming from uh, Janssen. We could, uh, oh, but I agree with you that, uh, in fact, uh, you can see that uh, I start to have uh, some pixels here in green, and you see that I have still some pixels here in green also, ok? So, uh, so I can I can say that uh, the result uh, is still consistent with uh, the fact that uh, this pixel will be classified in a, in a vegetation class, okay, and not in an urban area class. But by definition, by definition, it is due to the fact that it is oriented, and uh, this is what I explained to you yesterday. Uh, due to the orientation, HV HV channel will have a high value. So whatever you are going to do, uh, if you are using only radar image uh, and parametric SAR image, by definition, entropy will be high, by definition, because HV is high. So the, the third eigenvalue will, will be high. So by definition, this will be uh, affect to, uh, to the vegetation class, okay? So it's not su suspicious, it's just because uh, we kept uh, this image uh, like that. Uh, you have not to see uh, some uh, problem here. Okay, so if we continue, it is another approach. So this is for the DLR image. Uh, on the right, on the left, uh, this is a police image. On the right, uh, this is a classification with different uh, colors, okay. And the last one uh, was uh, uh, in Australia, uh, the classification uh, according to, uh, to different frequencies. So this is a result in a hellbound. Okay, and this is the same, ah, no, I'm sorry, oh, I missed this one. Usually I have another one, but no, I did not put here, in P-band. Okay, so it was very uh, funny because we don't see uh, the same results according to the frequency, okay? Okay, so it was uh, the last uh, the last uh, uh, classification procedure we did. Uh, we stopped working on this topic. Maybe maybe we can do better today uh, with a new uh, new approach like uh, deep learning, like uh, the other kind of classification. Uh, but we 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 stop. We consider that. Uh, we we get uh, good results with uh, our approaches using only physics and the wishard distribution. Okay, so if we continue, I would like just to uh, to give some words about uh, Polinsa. I'm not going into the details concerning Polinsa because you, you will have a, a specific presentation uh, or specific day. Uh, tomorrow. Okay, so I have two questions. For dual pole, uh, okay, so dual pole we shall see after, okay? Uh, it is the conclusion of my presentation. Uh, in the top, yes. Yeah. 
because uh, uh, this image is a uh, Hersa. Hersa, it is a airborne uh, star image from Hersa from GPL, and the plane is flying from the left to the right on the top of the image, and was looking from uh, the top to the bottom. Okay, so here it is low incidence angle. And at the bottom, it is a high incidence angle. Okay, so this is why here, this is very bright because you have a strong, a strong rotor. Okay, so it's coming from the top. Uh, ah, yeah, something interesting. I can, I could ask. Do you know what means uh, all these uh, small uh, point? Bright point we can see on the sea here. You can see here also all these small <coughs> points. Double bounce, no. Sea bridge, no. Radar reflection from beach, no. I have only one good answer. Moving car. Yes, moving car. Because you have seen yesterday that uh, when I went, well, not yesterday, on Monday, uh, with the lecture of uh, Tui Tour, when I want to create the SAR image from the raw data, from the raw data, uh, in, the, in the range direction, you apply a classical adaptive filter. And uh, along the azimuth direction, in fact, you are using the Doppler to synthesize your image. Which Doppler are you going to use? You're going to use the relative Doppler between the sensor and the environment. So when you have a, a stable environment, the Doppler will be the Doppler of your system, of your airborne system or your spaceborne system. But when you have a moving target, in fact, you will have a, a combination between the two Dopplers, the relative Dopplers. And the effect, you have two effects according to uh, the direction of the moving target. If it is orthogonal to the direction of the acquisition, you will have the effect of a delocalization. And if you have a, a target moving in the same direction as the acquisition, it would be a defocalization. I'm not uh, very well focused. And here it is a pure delocalization, okay? Because uh, the cars are moving on the bridge from the from the top to the bottom, and here the plane is moving in this direction. So the two Dopplers will be orthogonal. And so the, the combination of these two Dopplers will create a delocalization effect. Okay. So this is why here you see the cars on the sea. And it's very funny because at that time, so in 1988, when this image was, uh, was presented and published for the first time, it was very interesting that all the publications, all the publications after on people working on different uh, parametric uh, uh, processing approaches. Each time they try to improve the, the ship detection. But in fact, it was not ship, it was cars. Uh, it was moving cars, which are uh, localized inside the sea. And you can see a little bit uh, the other side, uh, but it's not very obvious, but if we, if we zoom, you can see uh, you can see also the cars on the other side because they are moving on the other direction. This could be Brax scattering for ocean if you apply the local incident angle correction. This effect should be reduced. I think which effect? The effect of the brightness on the top of the image. Or the effect of uh, the moving cars. Take brag effect. 
Ah, the local incidence angle correction. Ah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Here, yeah, no, here, yeah, no, it's not possible because uh, at the top of the top of the image, it's no, it's no more possible. It's no more possible because uh, you have a very low incidence angle. In fact, maybe it is not uh, the main lobe of the antenna, it can be a side lobe of the antenna. So it means that uh, your receiver is totally saturated. Yes, totally saturated. So the, the, the signal has a too much higher value. And so uh, the, the digital analog converter is totally, cold, totally saturated. So this is why it is totally uh, white. So it's impossible to correct. It's too late, it's too late. But along, along the aperture, so from the top to the bottom, from the top to the bottom, here you can correct. Here you can correct because you can correct the aperture of your antenna. Okay, so you can uh, correct uh, uh, the receiving signal according to your to uh, to your antenna. Okay, but at the top it's too late because uh, your receiver is totally saturated. Totally. Okay, no more questions. Okay, so some words concerning Polinsa. So what I would like uh, to uh, to introduce is uh, how we can construct the target vector in the case of uh, Polinsa, parametric plus interferometry. In fact, this is very simple. We are going to construct a, a super target vector, super target vector which will be the combination of the two target vectors after each measurement. So you have the first measurement, will provide the first set of parametric uh, image. So for example, the master uh, acquisition. And the second acquisition, okay, can be the slave acquisition. And will provide to you a second, a second set of uh, parametric information. So during the first acquisition, remember that we have access to the HH, HV, and VV channel. So I can construct, for example, my poly vector representation, which is represented here with a uh, subscript uh, one, which corresponds to the first acquisition. And then for the second acquisition, I can do exactly the same to construct the second target vector, which has which has name K2. And then I can merge these two target vectors to create uh, what we call a super target vector. And in this super target vector, I have information of parametry plus interferometry. So what I'm going to do, because remember that uh, each of these target vectors, you have the absolute phase inside, absolute phase, which is a random phase. So it's impossible to process super target vector as parametric and interferometry. Yes, yes, okay. Yeah. Parametric and interferometry. So remember that it's not possible to process these two target vectors or this super target vector because you have the absolute phase inside. So this is why you need to construct the equivalent coherency matrix. But in our case, this coherency matrix now will be a six by six coherency matrix, which is represented here. And thanks to the conjugate operation, the absolute phase will disappear. But what, what is very interesting is that if you have a look to this matrix, to this six by six Polinsar coherency matrix, on the diagonal, you will have the polarimetric in information which correspond to the classical three by three coherency matrix in the in the parametric configuration and on the off diagonal terms here you will have only the interferometric information so if you want to do some interferometric approaches like uh, uh, topography reconstruction uh, uh, like uh, Earth, uh, Earth estimation, etc. You will use this information, and if you want to focus only 
on the parametric uh, information, you will use the diagonal matrices. Okay, so you have all this information, you have the parametric, interferometric, coherency matrix, six by six, and I can average this uh, six by six uh, matrix. I can apply a super speckle filter on this parametric interferometric information. Okay. And what is very important is that what I have presented to you before concerning the Wishart distribution, I can apply the same distribution on this uh, on uh, this uh, coherency matrix because I have just to change the p the p value which corresponds to the parametric dimension. Okay. So in such a case, I shall put p equal six because uh, this corresponds to parametric interferometric case. So I can use exactly the same distribution. So this is very important. So just to uh, to, to give you uh, some information about the complementarity between uh, interferometry and parametry. So here on this image, you recognize on the left the parametric information. This is the corresponding Pauli SAR image. And on the right, you have the interferometric uh, SAR information. In fact, this corresponds to the argument of the coherence, okay? And so you can uh, recognize uh, the, 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 the variation of uh, this uh, phase according to the topography. Okay? So Irena will present to you uh, uh, most information tomorrow during uh, her lecture. But what I wanted to, to show to you that uh, these two information are really very complementary. Here he, on the right is represented the modulus of the coherence. So it is the interferometric coherence, the modulus. Okay. And if we go into the details, we can see that uh, sometimes you have the information coming from parametry and sometimes you have the information coming from interferometry. So if, you, if, if I look to this kind of uh, field, okay, open surface, you can see that uh, according to the parametry, I can have different signature. Signature. So it means that uh, I can discriminate the different scattering mechanism using only parametry on the left. And if I look on the right concerning the interferometry coherence, you can see that it is white. So it means that uh, the whatever the, the field uh, I'm going to consider, the interferometry coherence will be very high. So I cannot discriminate my different fields using interferometry. So in such a case, parametry is more important than interferometry. But if I have a look to other kind of uh, areas, if I look to the forest, for example, you can see that uh, using parametry, in fact, I don't discriminate the different spaces of the trees, the different density of the trees. But if I look to the coherence on the right, here I can discriminate, I have more information to discriminate the different uh, type of uh, scattering mechanism which can occur inside this kind of forest because this is due to, uh, to the penetration of the wave. I can see the ground according to the height of the trees, etc. So in such a case, interferometry will be uh, most important than, uh, than uh, parametry. Okay, so in fact, it was uh, uh, it was uh, two paths, okay. So, so there is no no time. Enfin, yeah, for sure there is a time difference, but uh, it was some minutes. Uh, it was uh, very uh, very close. There was an acquisition, then the plane because it was a airborne. It was an airborne uh, acquisition, uh, made by the by the plane of uh, of the air uh, by ISA, the, the name of the player of the of the system. So you have an acquisition. You have the plane turning around. And you have the second acquisition. Okay. Yeah, we we have a non uh, non zero temporal baseline. Yeah, yeah. Is the difference between simple insert and pull insert coherence? 
that the insert query also only takes one parameter e and pre insert takes. Uh, oh, okay, one parameter. Okay, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The simple insert means that uh, you have, it is a simple radar. It is not a parametric radar. So you have, remember, this is what I explained to you uh, at the beginning during the introduction. You have just one transmitter, one receiver. Okay. So you don't measure the polarization. You just have a scattering coefficient. Okay? So it can be HH for one pass and HH for the second pass. That's all. Okay. So in such a case, it would be a classical insert insert okay. so you are going to reduce your information for sure and uh, you will have only uh, one complex element which is a uh, insert coherence amplitude and phase that's it now in uh, our case in fact we are, we are going to increase the size of the information because we are going to introduce the parametry plus the interferometry so pull insert takes all in start text or parametry interferometry so yeah uh are they print out studies with non zero yeah okay so to answer to the question are there uh, the print out studies with non zero temporal baseline yes we had you have to you will have to uh, to irena uh tomorrow because she is from the era and she work a lot with uh with this kind of uh this experiment was one of the first, one of the first Polinsa experiment. Uh, if I remember, it was for a PhD thesis of Costas Papatanasiu. Uh, so it was in the 2000, more or less, at this time. Okay. Okay, so if I continue, tech. Okay, so the idea was to uh, to see from our side if it is possible to improve the result of uh, our segmentation I have uh, presented to you before. And in fact, I was looking to different areas, which are here on the red circles, and to see if it is possible to improve the segmentation. So we can uh, start with a uh, these areas, and we can have a look on the right. This corresponds to the result of the classification. Okay, so we chart classification, we chart entropy and the entropy alpha classification. And if we go into the details, for example, if I if we look uh, to the buildings of the center here, so we have the DLR, which is located here. So you can see that uh, concerning the classification we have a quite a good classification but something which is very strange is this building here uh, i don't see if you see my marker trying to find another color uh, oh. if you see this building this building is classified in green okay so this is due to the fact that this building has an orientation according to the acquisition you can see here the result with the police or image. You have more or less a kind of a green color, which corresponds to volume scattering, to volume scattering. Uh, yes, it's always possible to do a different frequency band. Yeah, yeah, you can do what, what you want. Yeah. It's not a problem. It's not a problem. After you will have to uh, to find a physical interpretation. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So if I come back to my problem, you can see that uh, this building has a green color, so has been classified as vegetation. So it is a it's a it's a wrong result. Okay. So this is due to the rotation of uh, of the building. So the idea was the following. If I introduce interferometry information, is it possible to solve this problem? And the result was yes, because in such a case, I'm going to use the coherence. And you can see that on the vegetation, the coherence will be low, but on the building, the coherence will be high, even if I have an oriented building. 
So using the coherence, now I can separate, I can separate my vegetation class. And you can see here's the result on the on this uh, image here. So on the uh, on this part you have uh, really the vegetation classification, okay, the vegetation class, and in white you have the oriented oriented building class. And so like that I can improve my segmentation now using interferometry. And the second uh, the second example is also concerning uh, this uh, this uh, this area and uh, using also uh, the the interferometry you can see that uh, with the coherence i can improve the segmentation on the vegetation area but on the open field interferometry is not very sensitive and if i go also here in the details i can improve my segmentation for the oriented for the oriented uh, buildings the oriented uh, houses in the on the on the villages okay so it's uh, it was a very something very nice so combining interferometry and polarimetry for this uh, classification and procedure approach. Okay, so that's conclude uh, the most important lecture uh, with the different uh, steps, uh, spectral filtering, decomposition, segmentation. And uh, now I can start uh, the last part concerning the dual pool. So you said it's good for forest and forest and coherence is highway. Yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. But uh, the difference according to what you what you have written is the following. If I have only one image, one image, if I have only one image. In such a case, uh, I shall use only entropy and anisotropy information. Using the coherence, which is also a forest non forest uh, good detector, I need interferometry. Okay, so I need a second acquisition. So if I'm able to do polysa, okay, you can do both. You can use coherence and you can use entropy and isotropy. If you have only one acquisition, uh, you will have uh, only entropy and isotropy. How is the unique coherence compute? Uh, okay, 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 I understand. Um, pop, 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 pop. I have not that with me. Anyway, going back to one of my uh, matrix. And okay, so if I come back to your question, um, So from this uh, six by six uh, matrix, I say that uh, in the diagonal, I have the two parametric matrices. Okay, three by three parametric coherency matrices. Now, if I look to the off diagonal, so behind this, uh, this matrix, you have a three by three interferometric coherence. This corresponds directly to the coherence, interferometric coherence. So the first element of this uh, three by three matrix, the first element is the interferometric coherence between the first component of this target vector multiplied by the first component of this second target vector. So in fact, uh, on this three by three matrix, omega, I have nine coherences, which correspond, each of them, 
to one channel to one channel. Okay. So when I compute this matrix, I have just to extract this coefficient and I have, I have immediately the interferometry coherence between the corresponding channel. Okay, so I have not one unique coherence compute. You have not one unique coherence. Because uh, I'm going to, uh, to take benefit of uh, all this uh, information. So I can uh, compute the coherence between the HH channel in one acquisition with the VV channel on the second acquisition. And I can compute uh, the coherence between uh, HV channel in the first acquisition and uh, HH plus VV uh, channel in the second acquisition. Okay, so I can do uh, all the combinations I want. You will see with uh, with Irena, I guess, uh, tomorrow that uh, you can uh, derive from the eigenvalues of this uh, matrix. You can uh, derive uh, an optimization optimization of this matrix to get uh, the higher coherence. I can uh, I can uh, I can uh, I can get according to the optimal polarization basis I can use for transmit and receive. Okay. Here I have used only the first element, so it will be HH with HH. Okay. So uh, if I repeat what I say. Uh, here, I can get uh, the classical inter inter uh, coherence between two channels, but imagine this is down from the, from the horizontal and vertical basis, because this is the original raw data. But remember that I, I can apply any, any kind of uh, elliptical basis transformation. So you can imagine maybe the most important uh, or the higher coherence I can get could be, could be, using circular polarization during the first acquisition and maybe a 45 degrees linear polarization during the acquisition or any kind of elliptical basis. So like that, I can adapt my polarization during the different acquisition to increase the coherence. Okay. Sorry for the question, but I think that interferometric phase result from phase difference from the two acquisitions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this is exactly uh, the content uh, of uh, this matrix omega twelve. Yeah, this is exactly phase difference. Okay, you have exactly uh, the phase difference in these elements because because you are using k. Multiply by k transpose conjugate conjugate. So if I take, for example, this element, it will be the phase of the k2 vector minus the phase of the k1 vector. So directly, you have the phase difference inside uh, this uh, matrix. Directly. Okay. So this is why this corresponds to interferometric phase because this is a phase difference directly, directly during the construction of this matrix. Of the spectral baseline. We use a spectral baseline. Uh, usually, it is to find the, the, the critical baseline. The critical baseline. Um,
because uh, for one acquisition to the second acquisition, if we take the spectrum to have a good coherence, we must have uh, uh, the two spectrum, two spectrum must be uh, connected to have an uh, overlap. Otherwise, if the two spectra uh, don't overlap, in such a case, you reach the critical baseline and your coherency will be zero. Okay. So this is the uh, only uh, step where I'm using the baseline in the spectral domain. Just to find the critical baseline and to uh, to increase the spatial resolution. Uh, if you use, uh, okay, different frequencies, <laughs> you must be rich. <laughs> you must be rich because uh, it's not obvious to uh, to uh, spay to for space born uh, to have at the same time different frequencies. Okay. Uh, airborne, yes, you can. You can. Uh, you can have uh, an acquisition at the same time in different frequencies. Uh, okay, so you you mean that uh, you would like to uh, to change interferometric information with multi frequency information? Is it uh, this is what you mean? We, we we did some uh, some work on that with uh, Janssen. It was for uh, for classification to do multi frequency classification. You can have some information. You can discriminate some information, and uh, we were using this from uh, from the Cersei images because uh, the Cersei images provide at the same time L, P, and C band. Okay, so it was uh, it was possible to do such a thing. We get uh, good results, but uh, maybe uh, this is something we have to work again on that topic. Again, so I have another question: Does which a distribution also tell us about coherence variance? Yes, yes, there is there is a link to the Kramer row. And you have the information about uh, the coherence variance. Yes. And we get information from the difference of coherence. Difference of coherence. Difference of coherence. Difference of coherence. Uh, Difference of coherence. I don't see. Uh, to Harry, I don't see uh, where I can get a difference. Difference of coherence. Ah, yeah, coherence is not the same. Operometry. Well, if you give me five minutes. <laughs> Maybe I can find uh, another lecture. This is the advantage to be uh, in the office <laughs> because I can find uh, other presentation. Okay, so this will, uh, I'm going to quit this one. I shall come back to this one after. Up, up. Do, do, do.
and I'm going to show you something. Well, that, okay, so that is partition, it is the other one. And this can answer also some question. Okay. Okay, so this one we have seen. Yeah, and uh, I did not want to present this slide because I'm sure that Irena will present it uh, tomorrow. But something which is very interesting is that uh, using parametry and interferometry, this is what I said to you before, I can try to find what could be the best polarization or transmit and what could be the best polarization in Eurasia to get uh, the higher coherence. And we can show that uh, if we uh, maximize this uh, coherence uh, six by six coherence matrix, we get uh, this relation, which corresponds to the complex parametric interferometric coherence. Okay, so this is gamma. Gamma is the uh, interferometric coherence. But you can see here, I have omega one, omega two. Omega one corresponds to the polarization state as the emission or the transmission. And omega two is the polarization state or the reception. And you can see that uh, everything is constructed from the interferometric coherence, whoops, interferometric coherence matrix, omega one, two, and the polarimetric coherency matrices, T1 and T2. And so like that, I can create the coherence between HH and HH, HH and VV, circu left circular with VV, whatever, okay, whatever. So some example, okay, just to show you. On the left, this is the coherence between HH and HH. HH for the first acquisition, HH for the second acquisition. In the middle, this is the coherence between HV1 and HV2. On the right, this is the coherence between VV1 and VV2. Okay, so you have everything inside the six by six matrix. And I can play also with the different combinations. So remember what I have presented to you. HH plus VV correspond to single bonds. HH minus VV correspond to double bonds. So on the left here, you have the interferometric coherence between single bonds during the first acquisition and single bonds during the second acquisition. So it means interferometric coherence between HH plus VV1 and HH plus VV2. In the middle, it is again HV, and on the right, it, it concerns double bonds. So you have the coherence between HH minus VV1 and HH minus VV2. And there exists a, an optimization. So the optimization is to answer to the question, which could be the, the best polarization combination to get the maximum possible interferometric coherence. So the idea here is to find the omega one and omega two, which are going to maximize, to maximize this expression. Okay, so this is pure signal processing. And this was derived by Eugene Cloud and Costas Papatanasio. And this reached what we call the, the optimum, optimum parametric interferometric coherence. And this is uh, the derivation. Okay, this is a derivation. I'm not going to go into the details because you can find this in the, in the paper. But uh, as a output, you see that uh, you will get uh, three different uh, uh, combinations because uh, well, it is a three by three matrix this time. So you have uh, on the left here the optimal polarization for the transmission and the optimal polarization for the reception to have the maximum value of the coherence and the same to have the minimum value of coherence. And this is uh, the final result. Oh, this is the final result. 
So on the left, you have the maximum coherence I can get. Combining parametry and interferometry and combining the optimum polarization. So for sure, I'm not going to change my hardware. Okay, the hardware is the hardware. I have made the acquisition using the horizontal and vertical antenna. That's it. I receive the image. That's it. I don't change the, uh, the, the, the radar system. I just apply an optimization in the signal processing procedure. And this is what I get. Okay. Using, uh, using parametry and interferometry only. And you will see this uh, for sure tomorrow. Because this is from this information, then we can invert this information to reconstruct, to reconstruct forest eight, for example, or forest uh, biomass uh, estimation, for example. So this will be the starting point, and we will see that uh, tomorrow. For the multi frequency classification, uh, no, I don't think. I think, uh, no, 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 no. It, it was a supervised, supervised classification. Okay. Coherence optimization in pixel wise, yes, 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 yes. Okay. Because I have uh, directly, okay, I have directly, directly the writing. Okay. So I can directly uh, derive the optimal vector for each pixel because I know exactly uh, the coherency matrix for each pixel, T1, T2, and the interferometric matrix for each pixel, omega 1, 2. Uh, yes, for sure, you, you, you can. It is always the same problem if you want to maximize pixel by pixel or if you want to uh, try to to, to, to optimize for, for a global image, but in such a case, you will have to define the optimality. What does it mean for the global image? Because you are, maybe you are going to maximize in this area and to minimize on this uh, on another area. Okay, so you will have to define the global optimality. That's why it's better to use to do it pixel by pixel. Okay, so I think that uh, this uh, slide uh, answer more or less to uh, some question. I got. For example, to answer to Paloma. Hmm? Okay, so this is a, a nice approach to do uh, what I want. Okay, whatever the polarization. So if it's okay, I'm going back to my previous presentation and to coming back to the dual pole case. Okay, so this uh, <coughs> the last uh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Well, this is what I explained to you uh, yesterday in the dual pole, dual pole case. We have to take care because you will see that uh, I can uh, apply the same approaches I have presented for the fully parametric case, but you have to take care with the physical interpretation. Okay, so this is the idea. So just to remember the, the, the radar system in the dual pole case. So I have only one transmitter. Okay, one transmitter, 20, and one re and two receivers, horizontal and vertical receivers. So I'm going to measure the two components of the wave. And the output output of my two antennas will be the John vector. Okay, so this is what I have presented to you yesterday. The output will be a joint vector, not a scattering matrix, only a joint vector, because I don't switch between two transmissions. I transmit always H, for example, and I receive H and V. 
Okay. So this concern, for example, Sentinel-1, and also uh, other space-borne uh, systems like uh, SAOCOM or, or uh, RCA. Yes. So now I have to introduce uh, new descriptors. New descriptors. Not the same I have used for the fully parametric case. Okay. So the starting point will be the output of my antennas, will be the John vector. So we already uh, seen this uh, vector yesterday when I start to define the ellipse of polarization. Yes? In fact, it was coming from the John vector. But uh, this John vector is also uh, a function of this uh, absolute phase, which is a random phase. So here also with the John vectors, it would be forbidden to do some uh, statistics on this uh, John vectors. It would be forbidden to do averaging of the joint vectors because uh, there is this absolute phase. So I need to construct another representation which will be independent of this absolute phase. And so this new descriptor, which is independent of this absolute phase, is a stock vector. Okay, so we shall see how to construct this stock vector. And uh, as we have uh, presented the covariance matrix in the fully parametric case, we can also construct a covariance matrix in the dual pole case. So in the fully parametric case, the covariance or the covariance matrix is a three by three matrix. In the dual pole case, it will be a two by two matrix because I have only two channels. So this is what I'm going to, to present to you. So remember what we have seen yesterday. This is a joint vector. This is the output of my antennas with my two complex components, amplitude and phase. And it was from uh, this information that I was able to construct the, <coughs> or to derive the orientation of the ellipse, okay? orientation of the ellipse, phi, the ellipticity of uh, the ellipse, too, and uh, the phase alpha. And it was from this matrix representation that I can introduce the special unitary matrix I can use to do some elliptical basis transformation. Okay. So this is what we have seen yesterday. But the joint vector, the joint vector, okay, now if you can get this joint vector inside this component, we have this absolute phase. So a first step to do something without this absolute phase is to construct this product, John vectors multiplied by John vectors transpose conjugate. And due to the conjugation, I'm going to eliminate the absolute phase. Okay, and so like that, I can get this two by two matrix, which correspond to a covariance matrix. So something which is very interesting is that, uh, this is what I explained to you yesterday, that uh, from a theoretical point of view, we are coming back to the theory uh, presented by the mathematician or physicist, ph physicist working in a, in a, in a optical, like, uh, like a Stokes, uh, like a Poincaré, like a Lee. And uh, Mr. Stokes, in fact, working on, a, on the light, uh, on the presentation of the light, as uh, derive this uh, matrix, he multiplied by he transpose conjugate and has expressed this matrix using the Pauli matrices group, which is represented here with the four matrices, sigma nut, sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three. And the result are these uh, four components, G nut, G1, G2, G3, which correspond to what we call today the Stokes parameters. And these four components are real, real, real components from a mathematical point of view. They are not complex, they are real. And these real parameters are independent of the absolute phase. It means that it is possible to do averaging on, this, uh, on these parameters. And so like that, this is a way to move from the joint vector, the output of my antenna, to the real presentation, of the same information using the stock vector, which contain only four real parameters. 
So each of them, of this uh, components, each of these components has a physical interpretation. Okay, so for example, G dot correspond to the power of uh, the, the wave. G3, in fact, if we go into detail, correspond to the circular information. G1 correspond to the linear, horizontal, vertical information, etc., etc. Okay, so it is another way to represent the same information, but using only real representation. So something which is very important if we derive the expression of this stock vector, it's uh, nice to see that uh, this stock vector can be expressed also in function of the orientation angle and the ellipticity angle. So it is another way to reconstruct these geometrical parameters of the ellipse of polarization. Okay, so as the output of my antenna, I measure my joint vectors. I construct the stock vectors, and if I play with the components of the stock vectors, immediately I can get the orientation angle and the ellipticity angle immediately. Okay, so this gives to use information about the polarization of the wave, which is coming back to your radar. So this is to illustrate the stock vector for different different canonical polarization state. So the first one here corresponds to the horizontal polarization state. So the joint vectors will be 1, 0, and the corresponding stock vector is 1, 1, 0, 0. This is a vertical polarization. So the joint vector is 0, 1. The corresponding stock vector is 1, minus 1, 0, 0. On the bottom, uh, you have the left circular. So the joint vector is 1 over square root of 2, 1, j. So the stock vector will be 1, 0, 0, 1. And the same for the right, uh, for the right circular polarization. So you can see that I have no more complex information. I have only real information. And I can apply also elliptical basis transformation. So yesterday, I have shown that it is possible to use this uh, U matrix to uh, to create my elliptical basis transformation from one basis to another basis. Okay, and here I can introduce uh, from a mathematical point of view a nomomorphism between a different uh, group of uh, of uh, matrices, orthogonal matrices, and this is the corresponding the corresponding O three unitary group I can use to apply an elliptical basis transformation on the stock vector. Okay, so the same way I can also express the stock vector in another elliptical uh, basis. Okay, so if I make the parallel between joint vectors and stock vectors, we can do the same thing. Okay, so this is the corresponding uh, Rotation matrix, okay, which are expressed uh, here. And something which is very important is that we are going to start a little bit the concept of decomposition. Concept of decomposition, and this was proposed first, but uh, by uh, Born and Wolf, uh, to uh, to physicists working on a, on a, on a optical, so trying to decompose, in fact, uh, the polarization of the light. And they express the polarization coming from the sun as an infinite sum of different stock vectors. Because uh, you know that uh, the, the, the light uh, coming directly from the, the sun has all possible polarization. So it means all possible stock vectors. So if I average all my stock vectors, I can subtract the most important uh, stock vectors, so the most important polarization. So something which is very uh, nice when uh, you see the expression of uh, of uh, this uh, stock vector is that you recognize you recognize the spherical coordinate of uh, on a point over a sphere. Okay, here this corresponds directly to the expression of the spherical coordinates. And yes, this is what we are going to use. So this is uh, famous. Point carré sphere, point carré, remember point carré, 
one of the, the person I presented to you yesterday. Okay, so with dual pool, with dual pool, our new uh, game will be to play with the Poincaré sphere. And the Poincaré sphere provides to you the information how the polarization can change during the acquisition. Okay, so without going too much into the detail, each point of this sphere correspond to a given polarization. So <clears throat> on the poles, you have the two uh, circular polarization, left circular and right pole circular. On the equator, you have the linear polarization. On the northern hemisphere, you have the left elliptical polarization. And on the southern hemisphere, you have the right elliptical polarization. So each point of this sphere corresponds to a given polarization. So something which is very interesting is when you do different acquisition, for each acquisition, you plot the point, another acquisition, you plot the point, another acquisition, you plot the point. And after, if you study the change of the localization of the point of the sphere, you can see that uh, your environment is stable or not. You can see that uh, is the degree of polarization of the wave coming back to the radar is stable or not. Okay, so like that, you can use this square as a representation of the polarization state. Okay, so this is uh, what I explained before. My stock vector has a spherical coordinate, so a point on the sphere will have the three coordinates, G1, G2, G3, and which correspond to the orientation angle of the ellipse and to the ellipticity of, uh, of the ellipse. Okay, so each point corresponds to a polarization. And something which is important, what we have seen yesterday, we have seen the concept of uh, orthogonality between two waves, two polarization. So we have seen that the two polarization of orthogonal is the orientation of uh, the ellipse is equal to the orientation plus 90 degrees, and if the new ellipticity is equal to minus the ellipticity of uh, the first polarization. Okay, so this is what is written here. The joint vectors and the orthogonal joint vectors. Now, if we transpose the joint vectors to the stock vector, and if we change the orientation angle phi with phi plus 90 degrees and tau for minus two, the result will be the following. So we have exactly the same expression, except that we have a minus sign here. So what does it mean? It means that uh, on the point carrier sphere, two orthogonal polarization are antipodal, antipodal, along a diameter of the sphere. Okay, so this is illustrated here. If I have a polarization P here, which is represented or which is plotted, on this point, the orthogonal polarization will be antipodal, so it will be along the diameter of, uh, of uh, the sphere. So this is very useful. It was, uh, it was used uh, at the beginning of polarimetry when we try to minimize the scattering from uh, environment. So I was doing measurements, for example, I was measuring the clouds, and I see that the polarization coming from the clouds create a kind of, uh, of different point on the Poincaré sphere. So if I want to minimize the scattering from the cloud, I'm going to use the orthogonal polarization. So if I transmit the orthogonal polarization, nothing will come back to my radar. So how can I derive the orthogonal polarization? In fact, in fact from the center of these different plots, I have just to take the antipodal points, and this will give to me the orthogonal polarization directly. So this was used. Uh, it was a work by a Polman. It was used to 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 maximize the the echo coming from a, a target and to minimize the echoes for from the environment. Okay. And now, if we continue to uh, to, to to describe this uh, dual pole case. We have to introduce, as we did yesterday, between pure target and distributed target. Here, it will not be target, but it will be a wave. So, in a way, we have what we call the completely polarized wave, which corresponds to the pure target. 
and the partially polarized wave will correspond to distributed target. Okay. And so what we are going to do, we are going to average to average this two by two covalence matrix. And it is like that, that, that I'm going to increase also my degree of freedom for my distributed target. So exactly the same thing. So I can derive also the eigenvalues and the eigenvector. So here it's very easy to derive the eigenvalues and the eigenvector because it is a two by two matrix. So I can write very easily the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues. Okay. So now the, the problem is to give a physical interpretation of uh, these eigenvalues or these eigenvectors. So I can create what we call the degree of polarization. Degree of polarization was defined by people working on a, in a optics. So it means uh, how the polarization of the wave is stable or change during the acquisition. <laughs> So if I have a high degree of polarization or a very low degree of polarization. If I express this degree of polarization in function of the eigenvalues, in fact, I find exactly the same expression as the anisotropy I have presented to you yesterday. Conclusion, the degree of polarization is equivalent to anisotropy. I can also uh, introduce the entropy. The entropy, remember, it was constructed from the eigenvalues of the, from, from the three eigenvalues of the coherency matrix. Here, I have only two eigenvalues. Okay, I can construct also the wave entropy, the wave entropy. So what will be the information provided by this entropy? Not the number of scattering mechanism, because you have seen that I have lost one channel. So I don't speak anymore about uh, the scattering mechanism. I can speak only about the wave, about the wave. That's all. So this entropy will provide to me the information of uh, the degree of randomness of the polarization of the wave. If the environment is stable, the polarization will be the same, always the same, okay? Like a pure target. So I shall be completely polarized. So in such a case, entropy will be equal to zero. If the environment is changing, like a forest, like an ocean, okay? So the polarization is changing during the time, okay? Randomness, entropy will be close to high. I don't speak anymore about scattering mechanism. I speak only about the wave coming back to the wave. Okay, so just to illustrate, I have taken the San Francisco Bay, uh, the ac uh, acquisition by Sentinel-1, okay? So you can see uh, this uh, image. So I apply, I use a snap yeah, to geocode the image. And so I have two channels, HH and HV, okay? Dual pole case only. And what I have done, I have derived the anisotropy, okay? So for each pixel, for each pixel, I'm able to construct the two by two covalence matrix, two by two covalence matrix. And then I derive the eigenvalues, the two eigenvalues, the two eigenvectors. From the two eigenvalues, I can construct the anisotropy. Okay, here. I can also derive the entropy. Here. So what I explained to you yesterday, it's difficult to give a physical interpretation of the entropy, or uh, the anisotropy. Usually, we have a look to, to, to the two images at the same time. Okay, so we are going to do the same thing. This is the image of uh, anisotropy. This is the image of uh, entropy. In the fully parametric case, my conclusion was anisotropy and entropy are really complementary. Okay, I'm using anisotropy to improve my understanding of the entropy. Here, yeah, it is no more the case. It is no more the case because I have exactly the same information. Exactly the same information. Anisotropy is constructed from the two eigenvalues. Entropy is constructed from the two eigenvalues. It is not the same expression, but it is the same information. Okay? So be careful. In the fully parametric case, entropy is constructed from the three eigenvalues. 
and anisotropy from the two smallest eigenvalues. I have not the same information, two and three, not the same information. In the fully parametric case, they are complementary. In the dual pole case, it is not the case because it is the two eigenvalues, it is the two eigenvalues, it is the same eigenvalues, so it is the same information. Okay. So you have exactly the same information. Last uh, point concerns the physical dimension. Okay, so what uh, I have explained to you in the fully parametric case. So remember, uh, for the fully parametric case, the pixel has a physical dimension equal to five. Here it is no more the case, no more the case. So what we have, we have uh, the joint vectors inside the pixel, or we have the stock vector inside the pixel. The stock vector is described by four components. G0, G1, G2, G3. But we have seen that there exists a relation between these four components, the equation of the sphere, where G0 square equals G1 square plus G2 square plus G3 square. Conclusion, I have only three independent parameters, G1, G2, G3. Okay, so the stock vector has a physical dimension equal to three. The joint vectors, it's exactly the same thing. I have two amplitudes, two phases, but I have the absolute phase. If I take out the absolute phase, I shall get three independent parameters. Conclusion, in the dual pole case, in the dual pole case, the wave parametric dimension is equal to three, three, not five, three. I have not the same dimension. I have not the same degree of freedom because I have lost one channel. Okay, so I can apply exactly uh, the, the, three, uh, the three steps, speckle filtering, decomposition, and classification, if you want. Yeah, so to answer to the question of uh, Pomola, uh, for, the, for the partially prized wave, Going back up. Up, up, up. So for a completely prized wave, completely prized wave. Okay. Uh, we have this uh, expression. Yeah. So this is uh, the definition of the sphere. So for a completely prized wave, the point is on the surface of the sphere. When I'm going to average, this equation becomes an inequation. Inequation. G naught square is higher than G1 square plus G2 plus G3 square, etc. So the point is not is no more located on the surface of the sphere, but will be inside the sphere. Inside the sphere. For partially prized waves. So the concept of the decomposition proposed by Born and Wolf was to extend this point to the surface of the sphere. Okay, so trying to, to, to see what could be the mean, mean, not mean target, but mean wave with a completely prized uh, representation. Okay, so in the case of partially prized wave, the point is inside this. Okay, so I'm coming back to. Yeah, okay. So I can apply exactly the, the three steps I have proposed to, I have presented to you yesterday and, uh, and today. Speckle filtering. Okay, so I can use. Uh, I can adapt, I can adapt also the Lie filter, for example. And so in such a case, the Lie filter will be applied on the two by two uh, covariance matrix. Okay, so I can do it. Now concerning the decomposition. Concerning the decomposition after after the, the speckle filter, due to, due to the fact that I have average, my four components of the stock vectors now are independent. So my new 
parametric dimension is equal to four. So I have increased the parametric dimension. It's not good. So I need to apply your decomposition. I need to apply your decomposition. Now the problem is the following. Which kind of the decomposition I can apply? So remember, we have two families of decomposition. The model-based decomposition and the eigenvector, eigenvalues decomposition. Okay, so I'm going to make a parallel, parallel between the fully parametric case and the dual pole case. In the fully parametric case, so this is uh, written here, the model we, we, we proposed is a free components. We are going to take uh, the, the, the Freeman and Durden uh, model-based decomposition. So we have free scattering mechanism corresponding to single bonds, double bonds, and volume. Okay. So I have presented to you in using the coherence matrix, but I can also use the covariance matrix okay, in the fully parametric case. And uh, what we have seen, we have seen that uh, this covariance matrix is a three by three covariance matrix in the fully parametric case. In the dual pole case, in the dual pole case, the covariance matrix is a two by two matrix. So what does it mean? It means that uh, this uh, two by two covariance matrix is only a part of uh, the fully parametric covariance matrix. So it can be the upper part in blue when I have HH and HV combination or the green part when I have VH and VV combination. So you can see that I have not all the information. So it will be very difficult to apply this model-based decomposition because I shall not have the same model for the different scattering mechanism. For example, if I take uh, what I have presented to you yesterday, this is a covalence matrix for the single bond scattering mechanism in the fully parametric case. If I'm using a, a dual pole case, I shall take uh, only this part of the matrix, which is here. Okay, so I'm going to lose this information. For the dual pool, for the double bond scattering mechanism, this is this matrix I shall get. So this will be the model of the double bonds. This will be the model of the single bonds. This will be the model of the volume scattering mechanism in the case of a dual pool. So my problem now is to invert from my measurements, trying to reconstruct this information. So you can see, you can see that uh, if I take a dual pool case, I shall have only two observables to reconstruct five parameters. Impossible. Impossible. If I take the twin pole case, it means the uh, HH and BV, like a uh, Terrace Rx. In this case, I shall have, in fact, three observables to reconstruct five parameters. Impossible. Okay, so you see that uh, in the dual pole case, you have to take care because it's not possible to apply the, directly the model-based decomposition because it is impossible to invert this information and to reconstruct the five parameters. Okay. So this is about the model base. About uh, the eigenvectors, eigenvalues, decomposition, uh, we have already seen uh, the eigenvector and the eigenvalues, okay? Uh, so this is very easy uh, to derive. This is very easy to reconstruct the mean joint vector. So exactly what I presented to you yesterday with the average alpha parameter, average delta parameter, average lambda parameter. Okay. So I can plot also the alpha parameter, but the alpha parameter here has nothing to do from a VC call point of view with the alpha parameter I have presented to you in the fully parametric case, because this alpha parameter is constructed only from two eigenvalues, lambda one, lambda two. I have not the third eigenvalue. So I have not the same information. So I have not the same interpretation. So it is completely forbidden to give the same physical interpretation to the alpha parameter in the dual pole case. Alpha close to zero doesn't mean single bonds. Alpha close to 90 degrees doesn't mean double bonds. 
okay? Because we have we cannot separate these two scattering mechanism in the dual pole case. Impossible. You can just conclude using the alpha parameter on the degree of polarization of the wave. Only, only. I can plot also the delta parameter. Yes. I have no physical interpretation. I don't know what it means. So something which is also interesting concerning the, the, the eigenvalue, we have seen that we can derive the entropy, which corresponds to the degree of polarization. We can derive also the wave entropy, and we can also derive the Shannon entropy. Because Shannon entropy is the expression, you can adapt the expression uh, with, uh, with the dimension two by two of the coherence matrix. So here also, I can split in two parts the Shannon entropy, one which corresponds to the intensity, the second which corresponds to the polarization, to the change of polarization. And I can get uh, this information, okay, about the Shannon entropy. And uh, the two uh, corresponding information with the intensity and with the uh, with, uh, change of polarization, okay? So I'm not going to conclude that I have different Yeah, okay, I'm, it is my last uh, slide. I cannot uh, conclude that I have different scattering mechanisms. I don't know. I can just conclude that the wave, the polarization of the wave is stable or not. It's changing due to the acquisition or it's ch changing due to the environment, okay? So it is my only conclusion of this. And remember that uh, entropy and anisotropy present exactly the same information because uh, they, are <coughs> they are constructed from the two eigenvalues. Okay, so the conclusion of the conclusion of the conclusion is that today we have not the solution, okay, concerning the dual pole case. So uh, if I apply uh, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors decomposition, I have the same information with entropy and anisotropy. If I, a dual, if I apply a dual pole model based decomposition, I don't know, I don't know the model of the different scattering mechanism in the dual pole case. So I cannot reconstruct. So this is why what I say yesterday during my introduction, I have, we have to come back, we have to come back to what uh, all the scientists and uh, working on the polarization of light have done to trying to understand and to find new physical meanings of the dual pole configuration. And that's it. This is coffee break.